but let's continue to pray together. Awesome, God, thank you. Thank you for the evidence of your presence, the opportunity to lift up your glory. Lord Jesus, we don't need to hear a word I have to say. What we've got to hear is you. So would you erase my stuff, but would you establish your word? And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock, our redeemer. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, can you believe we are one day away from 2018? I have, I've, I've noticed as I'm getting older, my Christmases are getting closer together. It's evidence that that's happening. I, uh, when I was a little kid, Christmases took decades, right? It was like one Christmas, and then you'd wait 10 years, and then there'd be another Christmas, right? And then around 40 years old or so, it got to right about a year. And now that I'm 55, my, my Christmases are six months apart. So time is accelerating. So that's, I guess that's the explanation for how all of 2017, just yesterday we started. And now 364 day, days later, we stand on the edge of a new year. Well, the good news of all that is that new years are times for optimism and excitement and new opportunities and new plans. This year, 2018, right, this is going to be the year that you overcome that habit, that you establish some financial independence, that you, that you, have a, you make a marriage that's greater than it's ever been, that you are going to, as a parent, be the best parent you have ever been, that you're going to move forward in your workplace and be a great friend for Jesus Christ and representation of Jesus Christ in your classrooms, all those really good things, right? This is what 2018 is going to bring. It's sort of like setting out on a journey and saying, here's where we're going. So I want you to see the picture. Yes! <laughs> 2018, in some spiritual metaphorical sense, it's going to be off to Disney World. Yes, we're going to get there. We're going we're to spend time with the mouse. We're going we're gonna to have a great time together. The kids are going to love us forever. They're going to remember this for decades. We're going to... So we pile in the car with all the greatest hopes, expectations, and plans. And then this little nasty thing called the journey sets in. Right? You got the kids in the back going, are we there yet? Are we there yet? No, we're still 1,217 miles away. All right, so they... They're there, Can we, is there a bathroom nearby? Wasn't the last bathroom good enough? Didn't I tell you you were supposed to? And then you find out the gas prices are higher than you ever thought they were going to be. And the, and the food stuff, when it's even decent to eat, is twice what you thought. Then the car starts to have some problems, right? And the traffic is horrible. And about three, 400 miles down the road, there is a strong temptation to exchange the glory of Disney World for this. A rest stop. Yeah. Oh, come on, am I the only one in the room? Children, I have great news. <laughs> we are not going to go another mile. We're going to stop at this rest stop. You know why? Because we're going to spend the rest of our vacation here. Be because there are bathrooms always available. And there's a little bit of water. And what about food? Vending machines. Yum, yum, stale potato chips. And there's a picnic table out front. Have a good time, kids. They mowed the lawn for you. Just don't step anywhere where the animals have been. I mean, am I the only one in the room who's been tempted sort of to exchange the trip to Disney World for a nice, quiet rest stop? Because it's just so hard sometimes to get where we got started going. And it's so easy sometimes to just quit. You can put this in on your outline if you want to, this next slide. We are prone to struggle with the drag of the journey. It's not so much that we have a room full of people going, 2018, I'm planning on being mediocre. Amen? <laughs> you and me, we're just going to be mediocre together. Nope. We aren't going to do that. We look into 2018 and say, Jesus, I want to be all I can be for you. I want to live for you. I want to stand for you. I'm going to be strong for you. But then the journey kicks in. And life happens. And the kids are crazy, and, and the marriage is frayed, and the money dries up, and that job situation goes downhill, and the health stuff sets in that we didn't expect, and pretty soon we're going, eh, Disney World, nope, rest stop, yeah, I'm just going to stop right here. You know, it happens to the best of us, that's the good news. Uh, Paul, 
If you read 2 Corinthians in that first chapter, he talks about the fact that things got so hard on his way to the journey of what he knew God had for him that there was a statement where he says, we despaired even of life. If I could use my metaphor, we decided, we, boy, that rest stop looked pretty good. And then there's guys like this, David, man after God's own heart, apple of God's eye, Mr. Killing Goliath for, for fun kind of guy, standing for Jesus Christ, strong, everything you'd expect to be a hero of the faith. And here is what he says in Psalm 6 as he struggles with the drag of the journey. Lord, do not rebuke me in your anger or discipline me in your wrath. Have mercy on me, Lord, for I am faint. Heal me, Lord, for my bones are in agony. My soul is in deep anguish. And then you, go, you hear him, how long, Lord? How long? Have you ever done that? How long is this going to be? Turn, Lord, and deliver me. Save me because of your unfailing love. Among the dead, no one proclaims your name. Who praises you from the grave? I am worn out from my groaning. All night long, I flood my bed with weeping and drench my couch with tears. My eyes grow weak with sorrow. They fail because of all my foes. That, my friends, is what happens when you suffer from the drag of the journey. It gets hard sometimes. And so you set out for Disney World, but often, <laughs> if you can have a snapshot picture of your life at any given moment, it looks more like this. There you go. Been there, done that? Lord, I started with good intentions, but uh, how are we going to get around this when this is the kind of situation I'm dealing with in my life? Next slide, if you would. The temptation is to settle for the rest stop instead of to press on for the goal. That is what the devil understands about all of us. Is it not that for most of us we have evil hearts? It's that he understands that the drag of the journey gets to us. And if he can convince us to abandon the heart we have to be all we can be for Jesus Christ throughout this coming year and into our life from there, if he can show us through all the junk that what's the point of continuing on? Why don't you just pull off and stay at this rest stop and let the heroes of the faith do their hero thing and you just eat stale potato chips from the vending machine? And do you ever catch yourself going, yeah, yeah. Well, then he wins, right? But you say, but, but yeah, what if it's impossible? What if, you know, I'm looking into 2018. I know how many times I've crashed and burned. I know the kinds of challenges that I'm facing. I know the relationship stresses I'm dealing with. I know the financial stuff isn't going to magically happen as far as I know. Tomorrow at, at 12 midnight, a pot of gold does not appear over the top of a rainbow at my house, and we just pull it all in, right? We, how do I continue on? Let's think about that for a minute as you face 2018. We are to run to win, but the Bible is also very clear that the way we win is by finishing. It is the secret the devil does not want you to get your heart and mind around. Yes, you are to run to win. Brothers and sisters, there's no excuse for intentional Christian mediocrity. You shouldn't know what you signed up for, right? We were called to Live like, act like, allow Jesus to transform us more into his shape and less and less into ours. It's not always easy. It's not always going to be necessarily everything that we would have enjoyed, but that's the call. We are to train. We are to run to win. So you see this next passage. Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. Folks, if you want 2018 to be a more like Jesus, less like me year, you're going to have to want it and go after it. It doesn't happen to you by osmosis. It doesn't happen to you by sitting next to Pastor Chris long enough until the Pastor Chris holiness dust flakes off on you. <laughs> right? You, you have to decide... To run to win. But here is the amazing thing the devil does to us. Because the run is hard sometimes, and because sometimes we stumble, he whispers into our ear after we've stumbled. We've begun well, and then, then we struggle. And the devil whispers, what's the point? What's the use? Why are you even in this? You're never going to cross the finish line first. There are lots of people faster than you, stronger than you, better than you. Why don't you just sit down in the infield and stop pretending you can run this race? 
because he knows the other verse we're about to look at. Here it is. This is Paul at the end of his life. If anybody ran well, it was Paul writer of big chunks of the New Testament, evangelist of the Gentile world of his day. Not a bad start for a Christian killer, or a bad end for a Christian killer, because that's where he started, right? This is what he says as he nears the end of his race. For I am already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have won the race. No, that isn't what it says. What's it say? I have, I have crossed the finish line, and I win. That's what he says next. <laughs> I have finished the race. I have kept the faith, and now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award me on that day, and not only to me, but to all who have longed, also to all who have longed for his appearing. Forgive me if I repeat this a couple of times. Christians, you are to run to win, but listen, you win by finishing. So the only way we cannot win is to disqualify ourselves to pull off at a rest stop and go, I'm done. If we have to crawl, if we have to drag, if we have to pull across the finish line, all we need to do is finish Jesus Christ wins for us. The devil desperately doesn't want you to come and get your heart around that. He wants you to pull off into the rest stop and live on those stale potato chips for the rest of your life and just be happy with having a bathroom nearby. <laughs> That's what he wants. He doesn't want you to be effective. He doesn't want you to see lost people one to Jesus Christ. He doesn't want to see you overcome and be strong and win this race. Next slide, if you would. So how do we motivate ourselves, or how does the Spirit motivate us to stay in the race on those times when in 2018, some of you, okay, not you, but Christians you know, are going to, are going to have some stuff happen in 2018, and they're going to want to just go, rest stop, anyone? When we sense that in our lives, what do we need to remember to stay in the race, knowing that if we win, or if we finish, we win, yes? Let me give you some things to remember in 2018. Number one, remember it's a war on a broken battlefield, but the outcome is not in doubt. I grew up in a country music family. My mom, in her yearbook back in Little Liberty Junior Senior High in northern Pennsylvania, says the next Patsy Cline. <laughs> so if you're old enough, you know who that is. If you're not, you're like, okay. <laughs> now, country music star from a long time ago. So we would sit on the porch. She'd play guitar, and we'd sing all the hits. Charlie Pride, Statler Brothers, Lenny Anderson. We did it all. One of my favorites. I beg your pardon. I never promised you a rose garden along with the sunshine. There's got to be a little rain sometimes. Brothers and sisters, where did we get the goofy? Is, is it us as American Christians that this message just sounds good so we kind of embrace it? If you have, a, have Jesus as your Savior and you follow God, it'll all be peachy keen and easy from here on in. And they lived happily ever after. Right? Isn't that, isn't that a message some of you have heard? Right? If I follow Jesus, it'll all be good. I'll never have another bill I can't pay. My marriage will get happier and happier. My kids will all grow up to be heroes of the faith and pay for my retirement. <laughs> right? That's how it is when you follow. Jesus never said any such thing. Uh, what I love about being a Christian is Jesus tells you the truth up front. You live in a broken world. This is not ever what God intended it to be. We human beings chose to take the beautiful greenhouse God gave us and throw rocks up at the panels of glass. And so now we have to walk through the broken glass. It's the fallout of a broken world. Jesus said it this way. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world... If you're a loser, you'll have trouble. No, that isn't what he said. In this world, if you don't behave, you'll have trouble. No, that isn't what he said. In this world, you... First thing you've got to remember, the guy who set you free, the one who you claim you want to follow, told you up front, don't expect it will all be peaches, keen, and rose gardening. In this world, you will have trouble. Why? Because it's a broken world. 
But the nice part is, but take heart. He doesn't just leave you there. In this world, you will have trouble. <sighs> oh, yeah. No. He goes right on, and he says, but take heart. Take courage. I have overcome it. I have overcome the world. It isn't that you won't have problems. It's that in me, you will overcome the problems. I am greater than the problems. Don't ever forget. Yes, there will be potholes. I'm better than the potholes, bigger than the potholes. I've won this victory. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. It's one of my favorite words in the original language of the New Testament. It, is, it literally is hypernike, which means hyper winners. You are more than conquerors. You are hyper winners in Jesus Christ. Here, one of the best things I heard at our general conference in the missionary church this last year in Fort Wayne was a speaker who said this. If you absolutely know you are going to win the football game, if you absolutely know without a doubt that when the gun sounds, you will have won, what are you doing panicking when you're down five touchdowns at the end of the third quarter? So we're down five touchdowns. Oh, how will we ever overcome? Oh, no. no, you absolutely know you're going to win. What do you do? You turn to the coach and go, well, this would be a doozy of a fourth quarter. <laughs> right? You've got to remember, folks, nobody promises this is going to be easy. What he promised us is we win. We win. How do we stay on, not pull off into the rest stop? Number one, remember, it's going to be bumpy, but we win. Second thing to remember, God knows where he's taking us, and he will get us home. Okay, true confessions. How many of you aren't quite sure God has a good GPS? You know, maybe God picked, you know, uh, Garmin, and he should have picked some other company. You ever wonder where God's taking you? and why he asked you to do the things he asked you? And does he really know what he's doing? How <laughs> many of you have sat in a hospital room with somebody you love and went, do you know what you're doing? How many of you have had a rough time in your family and you sat in a chair and went, God, which Gertrude Garmin are you listening to? How many times have you felt like God wants you to accelerate and drive up this bridge. <laughs> Ever been there? God goes, I want you to take that turn. Make sure you're on the gas pedal, because that's a pretty steep hill. <laughs> and you look at him like, what? Where are we going? No, okay, let's get serious. How many of you look at that picture and say, that's nothing like people telling me I have to stay pure in a world where everybody else is going along with the motions of the world. I'm never going to find a husband. I'm never going to find a wife because I can't play according to the world's rules. You got to be kidding me. Fight this marriage through? You don't understand how difficult this is. How in the world am I ever going to stand for Jesus in my workplace when my boss says, either fudge the books or your job's over? It's like this. God, you have got to be kidding. You want me to accelerate up the hill. And God smiles and goes, yep. Why? Here's why. This is the same bridge. See it? It doesn't go to nowhere. It's actually in Norway if you'd like to go visit it sometimes. Sometime. It's really cool. You sit at the bottom of that bridge, and if you have the right perspective, go back to the last picture. Can you go backwards for me? There. That's what it looks like. That's the problem, folks. Your perspective is limited. When it looks like God is telling you to accelerate up a hill to a bridge to nowhere, you step on the gas and go, this had better be cool at the top. But I trust you because you have the better perspective. Look at these verses. God, he's talking to a group of people who've gone through a lot of suffering and pain. 
in Jeremiah 9, he talks to the Israelites who are captive in Babylon, and everything looks done. It looks like they have driven up a hill and are going to drop off that cliff at the end of that bridge. And he says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, it won't always be easy. It's not going to be right away, but I promise you this. I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. I have a purpose and a plan for you. I will not drop you so much. I'm not playing a bad chess game in the world of fate and you're the unlucky pawn. I am not doing that, God says. My plans are for your best. My plans will get you where you're going. I know I have a better perspective than you. One more verse to back that up. Paul's praying for his friends in the church in Philippi. I thank my God every time I remember you and all my prayers for all of you. I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. The only way you won't get to Disney World is if you park your car in that stale potato chip rest stop and go, I'm not going any further because I don't get it and I don't understand. I will get you where you go. And when it looks like I'm leading you to a dead end, trust me, I see the whole bridge. With me so far? How are we going to stay on the road? How are we not going to pull into the rest stop? Another thing to remember, it, if it doesn't feel like home, it's because it isn't. If you knew that your children had a propensity to pull off at the rest stop, You would warn them, don't give up the trip, no matter how good the potato chips are, no matter how good the water flow is at the water fountain. Because if you get used to this rest stop, you might be mistaken, and you'll forget what the whole purpose of the trip was, and you'll begin to think the rest stop was really the destination. You've got to be kidding me. Rest stop was the destination. Okay, maybe this is just therapy for me. How many times? I'm just, I'm done. I'm not going any further. Doesn't make sense. Too much pain. Too hard. Too difficult. Can't do it. Won't make it. Um, I thought you said this was going to be good. He goes, no, you have to stay on the road because this isn't home yet. <laughs> you see this, these two passages? Our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're citizens of heaven. This is not our home. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which weighs against your soul. The point, you're foreigners, you're exiles. I love, I love another version of scripture. You're aliens, not the, the antenna type, <laughs> but the not citizens type. You were never intended to get too comfortable here. So if it gets bumpy, remember, you're not home yet. You got to remember that. Otherwise, you'll catch yourself parked at a rest stop going, flowing water and bathrooms, a vending machine, and me with a pocket of quarters. What could be better? And you're going to miss the Disney World tickets while you're eating those chips. You were never meant to get settled here. The world is not your home. If you feel... let me talk to the, to the students. If you feel like you can never fit in that school of yours, right. Because the school of yours is playing by different rules. If you're not going to fit in this culture of yours, everyone, it's because you don't fit. It's because this isn't home. You were never meant to get too comfortable here. Because this is just a rest stop. It's not the destination. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever get trapped. And they went, well, I thought it was good, but this is, no, this is not all there is. There is so much more. Don't get trapped by the comfortable rest stop that isn't home yet. One more thing to remember. Someday it will all be redeemed and it will be worth it. If you want to write this note down, the great joy of the Christian life, if you know Jesus is your Savior, the great joy is this. There is no such thing as wasted suffering. Yes! Do you get that? 
If you are a Christian and you know Jesus Christ is your Savior, there is no such thing as wasted suffering. There will be suffering in this world. You will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world, and I will redeem the junk in such a way that it will make the devil wish he never messed with you, God says. See this? Therefore, we do not lose heart. Though outwardly we're wasting away, yet inwardly we're being renewed day by day. For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. How many of you want to join the t-shirt club? All my troubles are light and momentary. Yeah, right. Most, okay, not you maybe, but Christians, you know, wear t-shirts. All my troubles are heavy and long-lasting. But you see the difference, as tough as it is, and I, I want you to hear me, we deal with real troubles because this is a broken world. Pain hurts, and it hurts for Christians as well. But the pain will be worth it because God will redeem even the pain. Our light and momentary trials are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. You understand, a million years from now, you and I will be sitting around a table with my great theological conundrum being considered. I'm sorry if I shared it with you before, but this, this is really important question for me to wrestle with as to what heaven is like. Will we be able to eat all the donuts we want? <laughs> or will we eat just one donut and be completely satisfied? You know, that, that's a tough question, right? So we'll either be having our one donut going, wow, or we'll have our bucket of donuts and our coffee. And a million years from now, we will be sitting at a table looking at each other going, whoa, that was hard. And boy, I was tempted to stop at the rest stop. But what God has done so far? And here's the exciting part. High five, high five, another donut bite. <laughs> this is just getting started. Don't settle for the rest stop when you know what home is like. It's going to be redeemed. One more verse there. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand, sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Turn to somebody and say it. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. You know, what, you know where that comes from? That's the end of the passage where Paul, after talking about how death is swallowed up in victory, taunts death. Where, oh, death is your victory? Where, oh, death is your sting? Thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In the face of death, Paul looks at the brothers and sisters in Christ and says, stand firm, because we know who wins this. We know how this comes out. I got to tell you, it must be one of the most frustrating things. In my ministry, one of the most bittersweet moments is standing at a gravesite. And we are standing at that gravesite, and it looks for all the world like the devil is one. And no, he is firing blanks. And we stand and we read this passage, and the devil goes, Ah! I've lost them, and God wins this. Yes, don't stop when we have that as our legacy. He'll redeem all the junk. So you've stayed this long. Don't mistake the road trip for the destination. Never mistake this journey we're on for the destination. You're not home yet. And never let a rest stop become your final stop. Press on to the destination. Don't give up. Never surrender. Keep moving forward. Even when you fall, get back up. Because we win by finishing. <laughs> Let me show you this picture. See that guy? That guy's name is Jose Closa. This is a picture from the 2012 Belgian Spa 24-hour endurance race in Belgium. They have driven, his team had driven for 24 hours of a race. The car was giving them a few problems. <laughs> over and over again, they pulled it off, tried to get it going. They finally got it back on the road, and with a couple of hundred feet from the finish line of this 24-hour endurance race, the Mustang gives up the ghost. And Jose Closa could have easily said, 
All that work for nothing. And all we get is a DNF, did not finish. But Jose Closa says, not today. <laughs> and Jose Closa gets out of his car and shoves it over the finish line. Thereby, his team placed seventh. But he finished. He finished. You, gotta, you Christians, you win by finishing. You win by finishing. If you got to crawl over, if you have to, if you have to roll over, if, if you have to drag yourself by your fingernails, we win by finishing. But there is an honest question, and that's this next one. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. But what if I can't do it? I'm talking to those of you in this room, like, Jeff, this is great. This is a great you know, little pep talk for 2018. Thank you so much. You do not know what my life is like. If I've got to push this car over the finish line, it ain't happening. I've tried. I've failed. I've tried. I've bombed. I've done everything I can to beat this habit. I can't. I've done everything to try to help this relationship. It ain't working. They're not going to get these bills paid, and all of your nice highfalutin pictures on the screen aren't going to help me. I can't do it. I'm done. I'm done. I can't go another step. I don't have it in me. Well, I have another picture. Remember one more. The picture you are looking at is the finish of an Ohio State track championship race in 2012. The girl from West Liberty Salem, Megan Vogel, had to, she ran the 1,600-meter championship that day, and she won it. But as bad luck would have it, she was also qualified for the 3,200-meter less than an hour later. So Megan Vogel has to run off the track. Everyone hugs her. She gets her prize for being first place in the 1600. She gets to the line in time to start the 3200, and she just can't, can't do it. She, she runs it. But as she turns the final corner, she is in last place. Her mother would later say Megan Vogel had never placed last in a race her whole life. As Megan Vogel turns the final corner in front of her, Arden McMath, a sophomore from Arlington High School, collapses in a heap on the track, 30 meters from the finish. How? <laughs> if you're Megan, I'm not going to be last this time either. But no, you see, she already won her race. Amazingly, while the whole crowd watches, as Arden McMath is down on the track, unable to take another step, Megan Vogel stops next to her. And begins to get the attention of the crowd. She bends down, and she helps Arden get up, throws Arden's arm over her shoulder, and they begin to walk their way to the finish line. The crowd begins to cheer and scream and yell. Why? It's a metaphor, folks. You win by finishing. We understand that. You win by finishing. And as the crowd cheers and everyone goes crazy, <laughs> Megan Vogel walks Arwen McMath the last 30 meters. And then, right at the end, she turns Arden so she crosses the finish line ahead of Isn't that a nice story? Brothers and sisters, that is no story. That's what Jesus is doing for you. I didn't say that. He says that. Look, this next line. And surely I'm with you all. He could have said anything. It's the last thing he says in the book of Matthew. He could have said, live long and prosper. He could have said anything. <laughs> And he goes, and just so you know, I will never abandon you. 
if you can't take one more step, I'll come back and I'll carry you. And I will ask the Father and he will give you an advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. He lives in you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. It is a lie of the devil that God stands at the finish line going, oh, here comes one of my friends. Oh, they went down. Oh, that's too bad. I had hoped so much more for them. What he does is he runs out onto the track and he gets down right next to you. And you're going, I'm sorry, I, I, I blew it. I messed it. I can't, I can't, I can't. The devil's going to go, just lie there, stupid. You look like an idiot. Just lie there. What good are you? You're never going to cross the finish line first. <laughs> I got to imagine Jesus, since I got my story. Jesus looks at him and says, shut up, liar. Okay, then he looks down at you and he goes, I got gotcha. you. Get up. Get up. I've got you. Oh, I can't. I just can't. I've got you. All you got to do is finish, and I'm going to help you finish. Don't lie there. Get up. I'll make sure you win. Two thousand and eighteen. Last slide. Stay on the road until you reach the destination. Jesus is your greatest helper and your biggest encourager. He is. He comes around the track. He doesn't matter. You're, you're watching all those great runners run, and he's running right alongside you going, stay in it. Stay. Ooh, you went down. Come on, get back up. Oh, Lord, I can't get back up. Yes, you can. I can help you. Oh, I'm going to limp. It's going to be slow. That's okay. I'm just going to get you there. This verse. Not that we have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind. Amen? You're going to have to. You're going to have to. You're going to have to forget it. As painful as it's been, as awful as it's been, whatever it's been, you're going to have to forget it. You're going to have to let go of it. No matter how many times you've gone down. And straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. And Jesus is in this room today, and he's got his hand out and going, 2018? 2018? You with me? Come on. Come on. Get up. Let's go. You wouldn't do it, would you? You wouldn't lie there on the track going, I don't know, I just can't. I know how it feels. My challenge to you is he'll get you home. But you're going to have to get up and run, crawl, limp. Heavenly Father, I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room. The race is hard sometimes. I thank you that you didn't lie to us. You told us that right up front. You told us it wouldn't always go smoothly. But I thank you that the victory is ours in Jesus Christ. It's already been won. The outcome of this thing is not in doubt. We win by finishing. We want to run to win, but we want to hang on to your hand when we crash and burn. In 2018, give us the courage to say, everything I've got for all of you and I will not let go of you until we cross this finish line. Amen. In a moment, you're going to get a chance to share in communion. Communion at heart is an identity statement. There's nothing magical about communion. There's no abracadabra in it, but it's not meaningless, nor is it just a symbol. It's a statement of identity. I am one of those runners in the race for Jesus Christ. I am one of those who knows we win because I've asked Jesus to be my Savior, and he wins for me. He died, his broken body and shed blood, and then he rose from the dead on Easter morning to prove he's got the power to help me cross the finish line, a winner. 
the only way we can disqualify ourselves is to quit. Sit on the sidelines. I'm not trying anymore. If you know Jesus as your Savior, this is your identity statement. I just want you to imagine today as you come to communion, just imagine Jesus standing there with his arm going, let's, let's run this thing. Let's get to this finish line. Let's not give up and never surrender. A million years from now, we'll be high-fiving each other going, wasn't always fun, but was it worth it? Yes! It was worth it to run. It was worth it to fight. It was worth it to overcome. It was worth it to fight that habit. It was worth it to trust you. It was worth it to stand for you. It was worth it to believe, even when the bridge looked like this, but you knew it went like that. <laughs> and my last statement, if you're a person in this room who this last day of 2017 goes, I don't know what you're talking about, Jeff. I don't know what this whole Jesus thing is about. Today could be your day. The guy who's won the race and promises to be there next to you forever, he offers you the opportunity. If you're willing to confess your wrongdoing, you're never going to be good enough to make it to heaven on your own. Lord, I've blown it. I can't make it. I'll never cross the finish line. But I believe you died for me and you rose from the dead to prove you could carry me across the finish line. I want that. Forgive my wrong and give me the courage to get up and finish this race with you, becoming ever more like you, ever less like me. That offer is available to you today as well. If you simply ask, it's free. What it costs you is your pride. What it costs you is your self-sufficiency. You're able to make that decision today and you can come to this table as well and make that declaration. Brothers and sisters, a million years from now, we have won. Still, that's a pretty good legacy to be looking forward to in 2018. Listen for what the Spirit says to you as you share in these next few moments. Let's just continue to come to Him. Just make a commitment. 2018, I'm in. I'm in for the race. I'm in with your hand.